Simone! <laughs> good to see you, my man. You good? Yeah. <laughs> and you? I'm great. I'm, I'm here in Italy. I can't believe it. You know, back to the mothership. <laughs> I thought it was going to happen. So, what? Well, listen. Man, this piano, right? This piano. Well, listen. So today I want to ask you a few questions because, of course, we've not been knowing each other for a long time and I am familiar, very familiar with what you do, but I've never asked you specific questions and asked you why. Today I would like to know why. So, uh, I, I'm, I mean, this is your podcast, but I'm going to be <laughs> hosting it for the few... <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> For the few of you who don't know who, uh, um, uh, who Simone is, although you're watching his channel, <laughs> Simone is a great UX UI designer and uh, UX stands for user experience and UI is user interface. Now, why are we talking about this? Because half of the work of making a synthesizer, a, soft, a piece of software, half of the work is the way you make it interact with humans. Is, is that a fair statement? Well, um, basically, when uh, uh, you, you build any product that uh, is uh, digital as a component of interaction, uh, the more complex, uh, the, more, the, the bigger is the number of uh, the features that uh, we have, the more uh, difficult it is to, uh, to present them in an easy way. So we, we should say that uh, user experience design is uh, um, a discipline that studies the entire journey uh, between the user and the product. It's not only making a UI, it is uh, about uh, studying every piece of interaction. So we have customer support, right. we have uh, the purchase experience. So now it's difficult to say that the product is just only the product, the product is just only the feature, is the entire journey, the customer journey. So we need to, uh, to learn how to provide the best experience from the beginning to, to the end. We cannot just, okay, we have sold it and that's it. No, yeah. no, no. No, of course it's not. I mean, and, and, and of course, you know, we, we, when we talk about sophisticated products like this, then it, I, I mean, you make it look easy. Can, 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 I, can I show the public? Can I have the phone for a sec? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, four colors, four things. I mean, it seems like it was obvious right from the beginning. It wasn't, <laughs> was it? <laughs> so, I mean, what are the things that you consider when you, when you have a product and you say, okay, we need to create a good experience for the musician in this case, because this is instruments we're talking about. Well, uh, in this case of the instrument, uh, we, um, we studied uh, what uh, uh, was already built in, um, in, in, in the market. And uh, also we, we started to find if there, what were the, the most common frustrations of the people using that kind of product, the other one, and see if there is uh, a, another solution. So then we designed uh, another approach, trying to, uh, to build um, a different solution, addressing some issues. That you found with other products, for yeah. example. That's Absolutely. brilliant. So yeah, I mean, this is obviously a big subject because, you know, how, how do you create that experience for the user? And, and you're right, you know, it's right from the beginning when, when you are even presented on the website and that and that cascades all the way down to the instrument. So now, specifically, talking about the instrument, what, what are the things that you, that you keep in mind before even starting designing the, the user interface at all? Well, the, um, the most important thing is consider that you are building a musical instrument that is a, a particular product. It's not just making a website uh, that we have a huge uh, amount of uh, best practice because the user experience and the user interface design has been developed a lot in the web because the web has a lot of uh, products. Uh, use case. Yeah, use case, absolutely. For 
the musical instruments is, is different. Yeah. But the thing is that, okay, you have an instrument and yeah. an instrument has a sound engine. So I'm not a, a sound designer, but of course you cannot build a great product without a good engine. So first of all, the sound. First of all, the sound makes sense. But? But? <laughs> There's always a but. <laughs> You, you can make a bad product with a good sound engine. I think that uh, you can remember a lot of examples of great sounds, but uh, with, with poor experience. <laughs> you, you, need, you need goggles and, uh, and scuba diving for menu diving, because you're going to be diving for days. Yeah, it's like, where, where am I? Hold on, like breadcrumbs, like Polichino. <laughs> it's like, where, where am I now? So, and how, I mean, do, like, like, for example, I mean, give me a few examples. How do you avoid that menu diving nightmare that happens on so many keyboards? Well, in, uh, in this example that was uh, a project in collaboration with, uh, with the Studio Logic team, we, we studied two different approaches. One approach was the analog style that mm -hmm. was uh, having one knob, one button for each function. Mm. That approach works very well if the number of uh, parameters and uh, function you have is limited. Then, uh, if you want to scale up, uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult. You have to have uh, add a second function shift, and uh, you have to, to add uh, other uh, solutions mm. that are less that are working less better. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, this. I mean, for example, this one is like super intuitive, like. Like it's four, 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 everything. Four, uh, four controls for the three sounds and the MIDI. Four controls for the uh, audio. It's, it's, it's everything is in a basis of four. Yeah. Is, was that intentional? Well, the uh, the idea was to to find the best solution, a, a kind of hybrid solution between analog uh, style approach and digital. Right. So the idea was, I don't know if you... <laughs> yeah, 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 please. Uh, the idea was to, to merge those uh, two approaches, uh, having just one, one level, one menu. So uh, the, uh, the idea is that basically when you click on, uh, on those buttons, you can select a different zone of the instrument. But if you uh, do a long press that uh, is indicated with the um, parenthesis. parenthesis, you access to the zoom feature that goes deeper, only one level on, uh, on the instruments. And uh, once you learn that idea, you don't have to learn anything else. Because it, does, it never goes deeper than one level. Yeah. Uh, unless, I mean, I mean Oh yeah, that, that, that's it. Yeah, don't, you don't go deeper than one level. Yeah, basically you have a way to, uh, to browse um, horizontally also uh, any level, but you haven't to go uh, much deeper. So basically the idea is when you are in zoom, you can use the arrows and, and move horizontally in that, right. in that level. And the second idea that you should keep in mind is that, that we have created small icons to follow. So basically those icons are representing the main joystick and this icon is when you push the, uh, the joystick as well. And basically if you learn that you have a long press to go deeper one level and you use the joystick to, to, to browse uh, according to the, uh, the visual in clue right. on the screen, you can do uh, almost everything. So, so, wow, so basically it's like a rule that you give to yourself. It's like, I am going to have not more than one level deep and I'm not gonna have more than a, a type of move variation for each knob so that you can get to all those functions without friction. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and, and the idea of uh, consistency across the rules that you have created, it's important because that makes a thing intuitive. So the, if uh, then you use the, the, the select button, even when you are in zoom mode, you are just switching the zone right. as you already could do in, yeah. in the first level, you know? Now I'm switching the zone, but if I do the long press, I'm going deeper, oh. but I can, 
I, I, I don't have to get out but, to exit right. from this mode because I can browse use following the same approach right. consistent. And, and this also makes sense because then the colors actually correspond so you, you also have a visual reference in terms of colors. Yeah. Do you know what? I, I, I knew it was easy to use, but I just I am noticing now why. <laughs> yeah. this, this is like, uh, okay, so I, I think it's one of those things that it's like mixing. When it's done well, you don't see it. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Gotcha. But then how do you account for people who have experience and people who don't? I mean, it's like, it's one thing to to give this instrument to me and, and I'm kind of practical, but I mean, how do you account for somebody who was a beginner, for example? When uh, you design a product, you have to keep in mind um, the distribution of, uh, of your user, depending on their skills. The user are beginner, average, and experts. Right, so you have three categories in mind when you approach this. Yeah, exactly. The average are the wider group. So um, if you take a look here on my screen, oh. we have uh, the, uh, the distribution. So basically, uh, as a designer, we should keep in mind to design for the average because the, the intermediates and the average are uh, the, the most common uh, users. When you start using a product, you are a beginner. Then when you, uh, it's a temporary situation. Right. Then you, um, you learn a little bit more about, and then you, 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 you go on the intermediate uh, stage. If you use the product every day for, maybe for your work, uh, for your job, uh, you become an expert. But if you um, don't use the product... Oh yeah, you leave it there, you forget, you, forget. you go back to intermediate. Yeah. Wow. So it's important <laughs> that uh, a designer should keep in mind to design very well for that um, stage. Mm. It's important, of course, to provide tools for beginners right. and experts. Expert needs shortcuts. Expert needs very straightforward, fast, fast, fast uh, feature. But uh, a beginner needs, for example, a wizard following some steps. Uh, needs an onboarding uh, routine. Yeah, exactly. So we, we need to, to keep in mind everything, but it's really important that we optimize the experience in the middle. For the intermediates, right, got it. So basically all, you, all you're really doing here is managing friction. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, it's, uh, it's difficult. You have to, to do, fail, reiterate, right. learn. So what we did in this example, but also in our audio modeling products, is right. designing and testing, validating with users, right. and then also getting feedback. the feedback. Yeah, yeah, of course. Another important thing that we did with the hardware was designing the panel and the user interface on screen, the, uh, the operating system at mm. the same time. Ah, okay. Because it's uh, extremely critical to, uh, to put the right buttons according right. to what you are going to show on the screen or what you want to do on screen. If you, uh, if you have the panel already done and then you have to build an interface for a frozen panel, it will be very difficult. Right. So, so basically, if I, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that it's not only having a piece of software, sound engine, and then work out a, an interface for it. It's also a case where the interface itself designs the software. Yeah, it's a, it's a two-way yeah, street. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the key to, to build a very nice, elegant design and consistent. Yeah. So uh, sometimes um, in some pro projects uh, you, you are hired as a, as a designer, but you, you don't have access to the designing the panel because right. maybe another designer has already done the job. Yep. So sometimes what I did is to talk directly with the industrial designer and to build a team. Yep. Okay, let's design that together because we need to cooperate. Otherwise it will be very difficult yeah. to to have the same communication 
with the digital interface and the physical interface. That's, uh, it is extremely important. So let's talk about RTFM, right? <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sure you guys know what that is, but let's talk about manuals, because of course we, we hate manuals. How, how do you go about writing the manual or what is your thinking around it? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a nice question because also people that know me about uh, Camelot, uh, all people knows, know that uh, I, I hate manuals and I don't want to write a manual also for, for Camelot. Uh, it's good because I don't like to read them. So. <laughs> me too. Good, good thing. No, I think that uh, manuals are not uh, the, right, uh, the right solution uh, because uh, uh, they describe uh, a way of uh, working, but uh, cannot cover each use case, uh, the different uh, uh, workflows. So uh, you need to understand how the, the system works in order for you to think and do your action, not learning uh, what uh, uh, the recipe from a manual. It doesn't work, especially right. the more complex is, is uh, the product, the more complex is the use case. If we are designing for, um, for Camelot, a, that is a system for live performance that manages the live performance, the way you perform is different from the way I perform. Yep. You are using different instruments from me. And, and, and there, are, there will be uh, hundreds thousands of different use cases. You, you cannot describe each use case. You, you need only to provide a consistent right. system approach. Can you give me an example? Yeah. In this case of the hardware, I can give you also on Camelot, but now we are here, it's very simple. So now, you know, this uh, instrument has four zones yep. and on each zone you can put different uh, instruments. In this case, a piano, strings, bass and a MIDI uh, section, uh, MIDI out section, yeah. but I could put... Uh, Which is yeah. brilliant, by the way. <laughs> it's brilliant. I could put and select another instrument. So. Once I have learned how to uh, adjust the level of the instruments, uh, switch sounds or go in, in zoom, as we have said, and adjusting the, uh, the controls of uh, each uh, section, then let's go on, uh, on the audio inputs. Right. The, this product has four audio inputs. One, two, three, four. So uh, the four, four is the magic number, as four you said. <laughs> so you, you click here on the audio. Uh, inputs and boom you new set of colors yeah still four yeah and here i've got the levels yeah and it's exactly the same format exactly <laughs> yeah of course uh, you know what because i was i was using it i wasn't even thinking about it i wasn't even thinking about it it was so instinctive and that okay i get it <laughs> i get it and you know if you have uh, a microphone on the, the, the first zone, yeah. you do a long press, same idea, and you will find a different controls that are gain, gain? and, no, uh, and, and Q. And high. Genius. So, uh, this is an example of uh, a consistent design. So you, you, you don't have to go on the manual and yeah. search how to deal with audio inputs, because if you have learned to play a little bit with the piano, that's it. That was your tutorial. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. This is the, the right, um, the, the big importance of making a consistent design. On other products, you will find a mixer view that uh, is yeah. difficult. And when you are on stage and maybe you have to replace uh, quickly a mixer that is not working, you, you won't be able to, to find a replacement a solution in, in your keyboards if you yeah. don't uh, go and search on the manual. Yeah. In this case, you don't have to do that. Yeah. I'm learning so much because also I'm building my website. So you have no idea how much I'm picking his brain right now. <laughs> a lot more than you or him imagine. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm stealing your mojo. <laughs> 
I just wanted to touch on feedback because that's something that I struggle with, okay? Because of course I have, I run a website and I run this, you know, mixing and mastering service and it, you know, it, 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 it manages uh, messages, files, zip files, exchange of messages, notifications and, and, and all of that. So when I get feedback, it's very hard for me to make it, you know, to, to, to make sense out of it because they tell me different things. How do you, how do you manage feedback? How do you then implement it? I mean, is there a, a secret to this? Because I'm struggling with that. <laughs> now, it's always difficult to, to deal with feedbacks because sometimes you have made something that you are proud of and then they are putting like a knife uh, on your, in your chest. So <laughs> it's, uh, I, I know that it's, it's tough, it's difficult. But of course, uh, uh, as a designer, you should be trained to understand uh, the goal and the frustration behind that right. feedback. So if the feedback is negative, we, we got also... Well, we need negative positive. feedback, yeah, because course. otherwise, how do we improve it? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. We are talking about negative feedback for that reason. Of course, we receive also positive feedback. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I would say that it's important that you understand the reason they are asking, because sometimes uh, people ask for um, offer a solution. And uh, you have to think about, okay, um, uh, this is the solution, but uh, I need to understand the why they asked me that uh, uh, feature. Right. If you understand why, then you can put uh, that uh, feature request in, in your brain and in your design and see if there's a consistent way to, to put it if it's not covered or maybe it's covered, but, but not well, and but not know. well, or it's not uh, easy to find that. So there are difficult, different uh, ways to understand the feedback. The, the, the most important thing is that uh, you don't uh, take the feedback as it is. And okay, uh, you are you are asking me more channels. Okay, I will put more channels. Right. No. So basically, dealing with people, it's uh, it's difficult, yep. but uh, it's our job. And uh, also, we have people that love your design, people that hate uh, your design. It's part of the game. Yep. And uh, if, we, you, if you try to please everyone, you end up pleasing no one. Yeah, no absolutely, one. absolutely. You have to keep in mind the target user, your main goals. As we said, we have to. Everything is a trade-off between different wow. needs. Uh, business, uh, time, money, uh, technical uh, constraint, because uh, I, I can design something, but uh, if it's not feasible, or it's not feasible in one month, but it's feasible in three years, it's a different story. Right. So it's not easy. But uh, of course, uh, there will be people that like or not. Yeah. And they like uh, people that are like uh, Mac OS versus Windows or iOS versus Android, you know. And, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, tri it's tri tribalistic. Mm -hmm. right? It's like, I'm on this camp, you're in that camp. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know what? Uh, um, people in the world are divided in two parties also okay. for the toilet paper, you know? The what? <laughs> <laughs> Can you bring me a toilet paper, please? <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> Are we bringing the toilet paper on the show? Are you sure? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> uh. Okay. Okay, so that's a get rid of that. So how I you... hope you're going somewhere with this. <laughs> Uh, when you attach this to the wall, mm. are you a uh, people that attach uh, uh, the toilet paper like this, uh, upside, or...? Oh! I have a very strong opinion about this, all right. <laughs> okay, so, I'll give you a demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> I do it like this, and I explain why. Because then I can, with one hand movement, block it and pull it. If I have it this way, I can't do it because it gives, right? Is anyone with me on this one? No? Oh, right. No? Everyone is, okay, okay, make a case for the other <laughs> way. 
What, for what reason uh, would you do it the other now way? For me, uh, it doesn't work. I was used to that. It's not closer to, to the wall, so it's... Uh, but you need two hands, because you need one hand to block it and one to pull it, because otherwise you do the, uh, the party scene, you know, like... Honestly, I don't know. I will keep attention the next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the end of the show, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah, well, that's, uh, it's funny, but to say... But that, it's true. So... You, you can design whatever you want, but there will be people with different minds, with different experience, with different observation, especially also with musical instruments. The legacy is a, a, another big topic. So if you have been using the same uh, company products, so say we have a lot of friends at the Yamaha, Roland, Studio Logic, yeah. uh, uh, you, um, you know that uh, those kind of instruments have a, a legacy interface. Yeah. So if you if you still uh, buy the same company instruments, you will be familiar with that. And so we'll... you want to maintain that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. But, but but innovation. Innovation. So, if you cannot change anything, it's difficult to innovate. Yeah. And also, if you are a Yamaha user and then you move to Roland, because maybe you want to have both, because yeah. we, we, we want that to sell products to, from every manufacturer. Yeah. So, it will be difficult to move from one concept to another one. So it's important that uh, you, you try to change and to yep. unify the interfaces and the way you, uh, you operate with those instruments. So, uh, of course, we, we, we need to be brave and yep. ready to, be, to, to fail yep. and learn uh, the lessons. All right. There is one question that I, that I want to ask you because, of course, you know that I love SWAM instruments and you've seen me use them in every possible form. And can, can you please share some thoughts on what went into designing that versus or as designing Camelot? Well, it's a very interesting question because Swam is a product that uh, was built uh, more than 10 years ago by uh, Stefano Lucato and Emanuele Paravicini. And um, I joined the company uh, in 2017 and uh, I participated, not only me, but uh, other designers were involved as well in, 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 in the Crafting make. the interface. Yeah, and we uh, basically create a, a new version. We, um, we updated the products, all the product family from the V2 to V3. And that is a, an interesting um, uh, story to tell because uh, Swam Instruments were already on the market had a different, uh, the original uh, user interface, and there was uh, the, the problem of building, of uh, in, uh, making a new interface. On of, a of something that already existed. Yeah, gotcha. and uh, something that uh, was also successful. So right. the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, um, deal was to how we can improve that without uh, uh, alienating the previous customers. Got exactly. It. So the problem of legacy yeah, that we, we legacy, talked right, right, before. Right, right. So here we have uh, this one is the uh, the, the previous uh, Zwam uh, saxophone, and here we have the the new one. Personal brag, just give no, him a round of applause <laughs> because that me, dude, dude, yeah. you guys did a great job with that. You guys did a really great job with that. Look at it. So sexy, doesn't it? Yeah, the idea was to try to create a connection between the old one and the new one. So visually, graphically, you know that this uh, curve that was a kind of material was reproduced flat here, here as, as a shape to remember that uh, that is a familiar. That it so, comes coming from that. Got it. Yeah, exactly. But uh, the, uh, the important thing was to make uh, uh, some parameters more clear and accessible uh, to provide the right priority 
of information. So as we said for the hardware, if you start uh, putting on your face uh, the biggest, the most common uh, par parameters, then you can go deeper when something is less uh, important, let's say less frequent, or uh, it's uh, more for expert. So uh, that priorities. Priorities, exactly. We can do uh, right, we can do wrong, but we can fix it. So the idea was also if you compare the uh, the options, those are all the parameters, parameters, sorry, <laughs> uh, um, in, in the old version that were flat. And here we have grouped them on, uh, on different categories. In this way, it's easier to find what you are looking for because you can go and search only in that category. In this, in this view, an expert can be uh, facilitated because yeah. you have to click only once. Once, yeah. You know? But huh. uh, if you are not expert, uh, this is uh, better for you. So what we are going to do in the new one is to provide more tools for the expert to provide uh, the big picture in one screen, but uh, the priority of building that part has been postponed because it was most important, as we say, to design for the intermediate. So basically what you're really saying is that my website will always suck. Essentially, <laughs> that's what you're really saying. No, but jokes aside, um, um, you know, it's like, I, I want to ask you one, one last thing, because I love these instruments and you know it. Uh, um, uh, is, is there something new that we can expect from, uh, or what are you working on? Or, I mean, I don't know, it's like, I don't want you to leak any information that you cannot, but it, what, what, what's on the horizon for you? Is it an NDA moment? <laughs> NDA, <laughs> friend DA, friend DA. Friend DA, okay. <laughs> okay. Now, um, a lot of uh, people know already that we are, it's not a secret that we are working on the string sections. Right. So basically the Swarm instruments uh, um, built with the physical modeling technology will be also available as a string section. We, uh, so far we have solo instruments, solo acoustic instruments. We have the violin, the viola, the cello, and with the new products we will have a section of violins, Ooh. section of violas, section of cellos, in a, a room simulator, so where we can put the instruments move them around oh. in the room. So well, they calculate the overtones and the, the interactions yeah, between the reflections in, in the interaction. <laughs> so the wow. uh, one thing that uh, uh, talking about the string section that is valid also for the other Swam instruments that uh, when Stefano uh, had the idea of building Swam started from a, a frustration, his own frustration that... With samples. Uh, with samples. <laughs> <laughs> we know, maybe it's yeah. an old story. Oh, it's not, but <laughs> it's very real. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to overcome the limitations of samples. So he wanted to have, to be able to decide the attack of the sound, the evolution of the sound, especially for violins, uh, saxophone, expressive instruments. For the section is the same story, so we will... Multiplied by... Yeah, uh, exactly. We will be able to provide that for each section. So we are not so close to do a polyphonic uh, stuff because it, it, it is not uh, uh, possible to have the same evolution for the entire orchestra. You have to work section by section. Because you got individual players. Yeah, exactly. But as a user experience designer, the challenge is to huh. provide the right communication about that. Because we have the expectation from people that are putting chords and... Uh, Immediate orchestration. So, right. with Zwam, there's a journey. You have to learn that you don't have a fixed ADSR. You have to think like the musician, the real player. And this is the same. You have to think about um, an, an orchestrator, you know? 
And uh, so uh, this is the most challenging, but also the fascinating part. Yeah. Because once you start working with Swam, you start a new journey and your musical skill will uh, earn a lot of points. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah fantastic. I just wanted to, you know, poke your brain on Camelot because, that, you know, of course, I mean, on this channel, you guys know what Camelot is. It's this great system that you can play things live no matter what their origin is, basically. So can you share some, 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 some info about that? Well, just briefly, uh, in this uh, kind of UX uh, journey around the, our products, Camelot was born thinking about uh, um, a way to facilitate the, uh, the live performance on stage. And uh, uh, the, one of the, the most uh, important things that I, I was thinking about was uh, that we have MIDI uh, already uh, that has been running for almost for 40 years, you know, MIDI. Yeah. And in 2018, at the time, <laughs> 2018, we still have to think about, okay, what is the MSB, LSB, Bank Select? What is a program chain where can, where can I find them? So, and again, back to the manual. Oh my God. No, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the idea was, uh, it's possible to create a, a plug and play solution to, to select a sound directly from a, its own preset name. So we, we started uh, working with the, with the different uh, hardware manufacturers. They helped us providing information, instruments. So we built a smart map. A smart map in Camelot is the possibility of selecting the preset directly from their names. <laughs> it's simple. It's, a, it's not rocket science. It's just a, a clever MIDI implementation using the SysX communication between the device. SysX is system exclusive. <laughs> just, just in case there's a couple of non-nerds here, which yeah, I exactly. doubt. It's a kind of dialogue, a communication. Yep. I ask you uh, a question in CISX format and you answer me with the right answer. So I, 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 if you are the, the, the Roland Phantom, just uh, like here, I will ha from Camelot, I will ask you, can you give me the names of your preset, please? <laughs> And then, right. so is that, is that, are you using the, always the same syntax or is a, each, each synth has a different syntax? Uh, each synth has a different syntax. <laughs> and that's why Camelot. <laughs> so when you press that button, you refresh the names. So if you have changed the your preset names, you can do that. But the cool thing is that we are coming in the MIDI 2.0 uh, realm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, with the MIDI 2.0, we have anticipated that story, but it will be with only one implementation because it will be standardized, you know? Wow, look at that. <laughs> Man, this is great. Like, this is nerds, nerds paradise. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, I, I would be able to talk about Camelot for hours and hours, but then came the timeline, the uh, automation. Uh, it doesn't matter. You have to just uh, keep in mind that uh, we, we, we are trying to provide solution for uh, simplify the life of the performer to allow you to go on stage and think about performing and not think about uh, machine. Machine. <laughs> you are not an engineer, so yeah. you, you, I think that you would like to perform rather than think about technicalities. My man, thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> and I really invite you to come back to London. I will? Yeah, please. <laughs> all right. Ah. Thank you, Claudio, for oh, visiting. Thank you, my man.